Hi, everyone. Uh, Sam Nelson here. Let me go ahead and uh, share my screen and we'll get started. All right, so um, hi, as I mentioned, I'm Sam Nelson. I'm the chair of the mathematics department at Claremont McKenna College. I'm happy to be here in the CKBK seminar today uh, to tell you about region coloring invariance for knots. Um, let me first mention before we get started that uh, these slides will be a little bit more um, full of text than uh, my slides normally would be for an in-person talk. And the reason for that is that uh, I want to make it easier for people to uh, be able to read the slides um, without necessarily having the sound uh, going. Um, that said, I certainly hope you will uh, be able to listen to the sound, especially toward the end of the talk, where I recommend having a good set of headphones available. All right, so that said, let's go ahead and get started. So um, when thinking of not coloring, most of us initially uh, encounter not coloring in the form of fox coloring, um, and uh, maybe generalize that a little bit to the case of quandle coloring, um, where we are assigning colors or labels to um, the arcs or to the semi-arcs in a knot diagram. Um, so for this talk, we're going instead to consider um, colorings where we're not coloring the uh, arcs or the semi-arcs in the diagram, but instead we're coloring the regions in the diagram's uh, planar complement. So the first such um, coloring that I ever encountered was something called shadow coloring. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about how that works. So um, we start with a knot diagram that already has a coloring by, for example, a quandle. Um, and given such a quandle color diagram, we can additionally assign quandle colors to the regions. Um, here's how it works. Uh, first, let me remind you what is a quandle, uh, for those who may not remember. Um, so a quandle is a set X with a binary operation uh, that we write as triangle that satisfies the following uh, three axioms. So first, uh, for all uh, elements of X, we have X triangle X equals X. That is, every element X acts trivially on itself. This condition is sometimes called idempotent, so we can say every uh, quandle element is idempotent. Secondly, given any pair of quandle elements X and Y, there's a unique element Z in the quandle so that uh, X is Z triangle Y. So um, one way of thinking of that is that we can solve the equation uh, X equals Z triangle Y. We can solve that for Z, right? So um, another way of thinking of that is that the action of Y on the right is uh, invertible. Uh, but it's not symmetric. It's not invertible on the left in general. So we call this right invertibility. And uh, lastly, and maybe most strangely, uh, for every triple x, y, and z of elements of x, we have the following uh, property, x triangle y triangle z is the same as x triangle z triangle y triangle z. So in particular, quandles are non-associative. Uh, instead, um, the quandle um, operation distributes over itself. So this is known as self-distributivity. Um, and um, so if you haven't seen this before, you might notice that there are three quandle axioms. And you might remember that there are three Reitemeister moves. And this is not a coincidence. Um, each of the uh, axioms is the condition required, is precisely the condition required for the um, uh, number of colorings of a diagram before a uh, Reitemeister move to match the number of uh, colorings of the diagram after the move. So Reitemeister 1 condition, or the quandle, uh, quandle axiom 1 is uh, the condition that uh, before and after Reitemeister 1 move, the number of colorings are the same. And similarly for Reitemeister 2 and Reitemeister 3. Okay, so putting those all together, it follows that um, the number of colorings of, number of quandle colorings of a knot diagram is a knot invariant. That is not changed by Reitemeister moves. So what do I mean by quandle coloring? I, what I mean is I'm attaching uh, an element of the quandle, uh, like X or Y, to each of the arcs in the diagram, so that at each crossing, when X goes under Y, uh, the new color is X triangle Y. So for positive crossing, we have uh, we use the inbound x, and for negative crossing, it goes the other way. We use the outbound x, outbound under crossing to be uh, the element x. Okay. So uh, as I mentioned, the quandle axioms are precisely the conditions needed for these colorings to be preserved one to one by Radomeister moves. 
Um, so, but in fact, it's not just the number of colorings, it's in, in a sense, that's the set of colorings. Um, and uh, as I say, it then follows that the number of quantile colorings is not invariant. So um, what I mean by the set of colorings is that um, if you have a, uh, if you have a quantile coloring of a diagram and you do a randomized remove, then there's a unique quantile coloring of the diagram after the move that corresponds. So in particular, if you have an invariant of quantile colored knots, what you can do is this trick where you um, evaluate your invariant of quantile colored knots for each quantile coloring. And then that multi-set of those um, uh, invariant values is now an even stronger invariant of the uh, original knot. So I call this type of invariant an enhancement. So, and in particular, given an enhancement, you can recover the uh, number of colorings by just take the, um, the uh, cardinality of the multiset. But in general, those multisets will have more information than uh, just their size, than just the number of colorings. So this is what I mean by an enhancement. So, um, then a quantile shadow coloring, um, you start with a quantile colored diagram. So here we have like X and Y. And additionally, we're gonna put quantile colors in the region. So here I put this color Z in this region. And then uh, when I uh, go across uh, an arc uh, from one region to another, going from left to right with when the arc is pointed down, then I'm gonna pick up a triangle with the color on the arc. So here's Z going across X becomes Z triangle X, Z going across Y becomes Z triangle Y. And the region over here, there's potentially a problem because there are two colors that it gets, right? One going along this way and the other going along this way. So, um, but if we just watch here, Z triangle X then goes under Y or goes across Y to become Z triangle X triangle Y. Uh, going along this way, we have Z goes across Y to become Z triangle Y, and now the arc it's going across is X triangle Y. So this is Z triangle Y, triangle X, triangle Y. And fortunately, those colors are the same because of the self-distributivity property of uh, quantile. Right. So, um, so this is uh, quantile shadow coloring. Now, unfortunately, the number of shadow colorings uh, does not give us a stronger invariant than just the number of arc colorings. And the reason is that um, if you have a quantile coloring of a diagram and you pick a region and you give it a quantile color, then um, any choice of quantile color will work. And, and just by pushing it across the arcs, that's going to give you a unique uh, color for all of the remaining regions. So what ends up happening is that if you have um, C <clears throat> quantile colorings of a knot, then you have the number of elements of your quantile times C shadow colorings. Right? And so that is just multiplying your number, uh, your original counting invariant by the size of the quantile. However, all is not lost. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, any invariant of quantile color diagrams can give us an enhancement. And we can define enhancements that make use of shadow colorings that will give us um, still more information. So the um, uh, initial example of this is what's uh, known as the quantile three cocycle invariant. And so the idea here is that at each crossing, we're going to get a contribution uh, uh, that will be um, at a positive crossing, it'll be plus phi of x, y, uh, sorry, of z, y, x, sorry, of z, x, y, uh, where z is the, um, is the uh, region color, and then x is the um, undercrossing, and y is the overcrossing color uh, along the uh, left-hand side of the uh, crossing when the crossing is pointing down. So this is uh, the positive crossing plus phi of zxy, and at a negative crossing, we uh, multiply by minus one. So we have minus phi of zxy. So uh, for each shadow coloring, we take a sum of those crossing weights. And um, the quantile three cocycle condition um, is exactly the condition that guarantees that the sum is not changed by doing Rademeister three moves. So um, we put this together to get a polynomial invariant uh, by summing over shadow colorings. Uh, we have our formal variable u, which we raise to the power of the weight sum uh, for each of the shadow colorings. Um, so this gives us a polynomial invariant that um, gives us back the number of shadow colorings when we evaluate it at u equals one. Uh, but in general, it's a stronger invariant. Right? You can imagine um, two, um, 
you know, knots that have the same number of shadow colorings, but their um, polynomial, uh, their weight sums, you know, break down differently and give you different polynomial. Okay, so, um, and in particular, this invariant has an interpretation in terms of surface links. So um, you can think of the, the, um, the regions in the planar complement as, um, if you kind of fill that in with a, with a, uh, um, with a, uh, a sheet, um, you can think of that diagram as giving you a sort of like cross section of a, of a surface link. Okay, this is the point where I would normally pause to ask for questions, but since this is a recording, I will just go ahead. So um, now um, uh, moving on from the shadow coloring uh, idea, uh, you might say, <clears throat> well, how about we do um, region colorings where we don't already have uh, an edge coloring uh, with a quandal or, or anything else? So um, Magic Nepchadovsky wrote about uh, this uh, notion uh, of uh, coloring um, regions with a sort of generic structure um, that he called uh, not theoretic ternary quasi groups. So I have instead been calling them Nepchadovsky tri brackets. So uh, unlike uh, the Quandl situation, um, these are not the, the, uh, the algebra of uh, tri-brackets uh, does not use a binary operation like the Quandl uh, case, but instead it uses uh, um, a ternary operation. So in other words, a function that takes in three inputs and gives you back one output. So um, I, I personally perceive this operation as kind of a little bit analogous to a Lie bracket. So that's the reason that I'm writing it with a kind of a bracket notation like this. So but we have three operands, of, uh, like left and then middle and then right uh, operand. OK. Uh, and uh, these three go together, and they form uh, just a single uh, element of the tri-bracket uh, for output. So there are, broadly speaking, two types of tri-brackets, uh, which um, I've called horizontal and vertical tri-brackets. So let's start with the horizontal tri-bracket idea. So um, essentially, these are going to be structure, algebraic structures that are motivated by not coloring. Right? So we'll start with the coloring this time. So for horizontal tri-bracket, at a positive crossing, I'm going to have my three regions A, B, and C arranged this way. Um, and um, so this, the three of these uh, join up together with tri-bracket operation to give us uh, tri-bracket ABC. And at a negative crossing, uh, we just switch the, uh, the C and the B, and we still have the same operation over here, uh, ABC. So um, when you look at uh, what are the conditions that are imposed on this algebraic structure by the Rademeister moves, we end up getting the following two axioms. So first, we need that the operation has to be left, center, and right invertible. Right? So what I mean by that is that if you have uh, given x, y, and z, um, and also, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, if you have given a triple x, y, and z uh, of elements of x, then there are unique elements a, b, and c, so that z can be written as x as a tri-bracket of x with y with a, and as x with b with y, and as c with x with y. Right? So um, in other words, um, you can always solve if you have like x, y blank equals z, wherever that blank is in the tri-bracket, you can always solve for it in a unique way. There's always a unique solution to that. So um, this is what was expressed by the term uh, ternary uh, quasi-group. In general, a, a quasi-group is uh, a structure where you have invertibility. And here we have, um, all, we have ternary invertibility, right? uh, invertibility in, in, all three of the, uh, uh, in all three of the positions. Um, but not, not just every ternary quasi-group um, satisfies the Rademeister moves. We also need this, this, extra, this extra condition. So uh, for all um, x, y, z, and w, uh, we, we need to have right, the, the property uh, the, that comes from the Rademeister 3 move is that tri-bracket of z with tri-bracket x, y, z with tri-bracket x, z, w should be the same as tri-bracket of y with tri-bracket x, y, z with tri-bracket x, y, w. And that should be the same as the tri-bracket of w with tri-bracket of x, y, w with tri-bracket of x, z, w. So that's the horizontal tri-bracket axiom. 
uh, or uh, axioms, right? So we can also, um, sort of alternate notation, uh, write these uh, tri-bracket operations vertically. So here, if I have A, B, and D at a positive crossing, then um, putting them um, together uh, with the vertical tri-bracket, this lower region will be called uh, vertical tri-bracket at A, B, D. And again, if we switch the, uh, the top and bottom colors, um, then we go from a positive to negative crossing. So for a vertical tri-bracket, um, again, we're combining three elements with a, uh, with a, uh, uh, with a uh, ternary operation um, to get a single element in X. And um, again, we need a left, center, and right invertibility. Um, incidentally, one thing that is interesting to me about this is that in the binary operation case of quandle and also with biquandles, um, we have separate uh, conditions imposed by Reitermeister two and three, whereas with the, these ternary, ternary operations, um, the Reitermeister two condition is what gives us um, these uh, left, center, and right invertibility uh, requirements, and that automatically satisfies Reitermeister one. So anyway, then, um, but the Reitermeister three condition, when we write the tri-bracket vertically, looks like two separate equations, uh, tri-bracket of x, y with tri-bracket y, z, w is the same as tri-bracket of x with tri-bracket x, y, z with tri-bracket of tri-bracket of x, y, z with z, w. Um, and uh, similarly over here, um, if you have the, um, you can have the tri-bracket in the, uh, here we have the tri-bracket at the end. Uh, we can also do the same thing with the tri-bracket at the beginning and we get uh, this, uh, this setup, this equation. Okay, so um, these are the uh, vertical tri-bracket axioms. So um, it turns out that every horizontal tri-bracket can be expressed as a vertical tri-bracket and vice versa. So in some sense, um, they're really just two different notations for writing the same thing. But as you might imagine, the algebra, because the axioms are different, the, uh, the algebraic structures themselves are a little bit different. And so sometimes uh, it can be very useful to be able to switch between the two notations um, in order to simplify uh, uh, computations and so forth. So I like to keep both sorts of notation around. Okay, so um, the operation table of a uh, tri-bracket is um, a three tensor. In other words, um, it's a 3D cube of entries because we have three, um, there's three inputs, right? So you have three, three axes of, of, uh, of um, uh, inputs to your operation table. So um, since the paper that we write on is two-dimensional, we tend to flatten this out. So we, you can write a three tensor as a vector of matrices or as a matrix of vectors. Um, so here's an example of uh, an operation three tensor. So um, the, way to, the way to interpret this is, that uh, you want to imagine that these matrices are kind of stacked horizontally one on top of the other. So this first one is the uh, one level, and then the second one is the two level, and the third one is the three level. So if I wanted to compute the tri-bracket of say um, three, two, one, I would look in matrix three, and then row two, and then column one. And so that's gonna give me a two in this, in this particular case. So um, you can check that this particular operation three tensor um, satisfies um, the uh, uh, horizontal tri-bracket uh, axioms, um, where we're using um, the class of three for zero. Um, uh, you can interpret this as a Z mod three. And so anyway, that's not really important for what we're doing right now. Um, but um, you can check that this uh, satisfies um, the, uh, uh, the tri-bracket uh, uh, axioms. So um, I want to uh, use this to uh, distinguish, or show you how to distinguish the uh, hop flank from the unlink of two components using this uh, uh, three tensor. So if we um, just look at labeling the, the different regions over here, on the right for the uh, unlink of three component of two components, I'm sorry, there are three regions. Uh, there's the inside of the one circle, which we'll call A, the inside of the other circle, which we'll call C, and then the um, outside region, which I'll call B. 
for the hop flank, if I call this region A and the outside region B and then this middle region C, then at this crossing, we get <clears throat> that this region should be labeled tri-bracketed ABC. And going through this crossing, we get that it should be labeled ACB. So in order for the coloring to be valid, we need that ABC should be the same as ACB. Now, if we come back here to our operation three tensor here, um, what this is going to, to tell us is that for any uh, choice of A that we're using to color, uh, we need the BC entry to match the CB entry in the A level of the three tensor. So we're looking for <coughs> um, elements um, which are the same um, when we transpose the matrix. <clears throat> and as you can see, for this first level, that's only going to be along the diagonal. And then the same is true for the second level and for the third level. So altogether, there are three, six, nine total um, colorings of the uh, hop flank by that tri-bracket. Whereas um, for the unlink of two components, let me go back here. I, I'm sorry, I kind of went past this one kind of quickly. So looking at our operation three tensor, this only happens along the diagonals of the matrices. So there are a total of nine colorings uh, for the hot flank. On the other hand, for the unlink of two components, um, there's no condition, there's no crossing, so there's no conditions uh, that are imposed. So A, B, and C can be anything. And so there are, uh, you know, in, independent choices for three independent choices for A, for, uh, three for B, three for C. So we have three to the third or 27 colorings of the unlink. And so since 27 and nine are different, um, the links are distinguished by the um, tri-bracket coloring uh, invariant. Okay, so um, this is the basics of uh, tri-bracket coloring. Um, again, I would normally be pausing to ask for questions at this point, but since it's a recording, I'll just go on ahead. So um, <clears throat> for the uh, for the remainder of this talk, I'm going to briefly describe a number of projects that I've done in recent years uh, using tri-brackets. Most of these, as I say here, have already appeared in journals. All of them are available on archive.org. All right, so the um, first one is about virtual tri-brackets. This is joint work with my um, CMC senior thesis student, Shane Pico, from uh, 2018. So. For virtual tri-brackets, we wanted to look at tri-bracket colorings of virtual knots. This is a seminar partially about virtual knots after all, so it seems good to talk about virtual knots. Um, well, with quantile coloring for virtual knots, um, there's a very easy thing to do, which is just ignore the virtual crossings and you just get quantile colorings uh, automatically. But um, for, uh, for region colorings, that doesn't work. And the reason is because um, virtual knots um, have this stabilization move where um, you can think of a virtual knot as an, as an equivalence class of knots drawn on a surface, um, some compact surface like a sphere or torus or something, <coughs> excuse me. But um, uh, you have to allow stabilization, uh, meaning that uh, at any point you could, um, you could uh, remove disks uh, from two regions that don't intersect the knot and then join them together with a tube with a with a handle um, and uh, so i like to think of um, virtual knots as sort of living in a space that has these kind of unstable wormholes that are appearing and disappearing so um, but anyway when you think of stabilization uh, moves what that means is that any two regions could be the same Right, so you don't just write out at, just right at the beginning, how, how are you gonna region color um, the, the complement of a virtual knot? So the idea is to think of it less geometrically, but more combinatorially. And so really think in terms of virtual knot diagrams. So then what we do is we introduce a tri-bracket operation at virtual crossings, which we'll write uh, like this. Um, so we have A, B, and C here, then we'll call this uh, virtual tri-bracket of A, B, and C. Okay, <clears throat> so then um, in addition to the usual tri-bracket axioms, we have some additional axioms that come from the, uh, from the virtual moves. So if you want to see the details of that, um, I'll, I'll let you take a look at uh, that paper, which um, is, as I say, published and also is on archive. Um, 
Another project that I did about tri brackets was with um, Deanna Medill, who was my colleague at CMC before she moved to UCLA, and then uh, Edward Shi, who was um, a uh, he was not my senior thesis student, but he was a student of mine and a grader of mine for algebraic topology, and uh, just a great student overall. And so he wanted to uh, do a project, and Deanna and I had already uh, looked a little bit at tri brackets in another form. So we decided to look at tri-bracket modules. So um, a tri-bracket module um, starts with a tri-bracket coloring um, and then gives uh, a kind of secondary region coloring. Um, in the Quandl case, we thought of these things as beads, um, but a bead doesn't really sit on a region very well. So, I mean, it can, but it'll sort of roll off or something. So instead, uh, we visualize these secondary colors as stickers uh, that we stick in the regions. And uh, so then the stickers will have a tri-bracket operation um, with coefficients. That it'll be a linear combination uh, with coefficients that depend on the primary region coloring, right? So here's the precise uh, setup. So if you have um, A, B, C, and tri-bracket A, B, C over here, and then we have these stickers, uh, U, V, W, and Z, then, um, <clears throat> the, uh, then we'll make Z will be uh, this linear combination of <coughs> excuse me, of uh, U, V, and W, um, but with coefficients that depend on the tri-bracket colorings um, here at the, um, at the uh, crossing. So um, these are uh, elements in some commutative ring with identity, uh, could be a field, could be Z mod N, or just you know, any commutative ring with identity. But um, so then we get uh, axioms from the uh, tri-bracket colored Reidmeister moves, which again are kind of lengthy and not really very enlightening to see. So I will let you look them up in the paper if you're interested. But um, we get the set of conditions that as long as the uh, coefficients satisfy those conditions, then we'll have um, uh, and um, you know, these colorings will be invariant under Reidmeister moves. So the reason for thinking of this kind of linear combination thing is that there's a type of tri-bracket called an Alexander tri-bracket um, that determines the Alexander polynomial and the other, uh, the, uh, the Alexander invariant and so forth. Um, and <clears throat> so this tri these tri-bracket modules give us a kind of customized Alexander tri-bracket for the different uh, tri-bracket colorings of, of, the, of uh, the knot that we're starting with. So we can use this to enhance the counting invariant in several ways. Uh, for example, in the paper, we um, just counted the number of sticker colorings uh, <clears throat> to get a uh, sort of signature for uh, each of the primary colorings. Um, and so this gives us, again, an enhanced invariant that is stronger than the original um, uh, counting invariant. OK, moving on. Um, I had uh, a <clears throat> senior thesis student, Evan Paltish, at CMC in uh, 2019. And uh, so we decided to um, <clears throat> look at this, this idea that we called multi-tri brackets. So <clears throat> this is a generalization of the virtual tri bracket idea, where instead of, so in a virtual tri bracket, you have um, classical crossings, and then you have virtual crossings. And <clears throat> what we can do is, uh, for multi-tri brackets, we can expand the number of different crossing types. And so you have some sort of set of crossing types. And for each crossing type, it gets its own um, tri-bracket operation. And then um, the interaction moves um, that say how those different crossings interact uh, are going to give us the, um, the algebraic conditions on those tri-bracket operations. Um, and so we call this kind of structure a multi-tri-bracket. Right? So a uh, virtual tri-bracket is one example of a multi-tri-bracket. Um, in our paper, Evan and I studied um, two other uh, cases of um, multi-tri-brackets, so parity virtual tri-brackets. So this is where um, uh, each crossing in a classical or virtual knot can be given uh, a parity, either even or odd, depending on um, if you start at that crossing at, say, the overcrossing point, and then you chase around the knot and count how many crossing points do you go through until you get back to the to that crossing point, that number is either even or odd, and it doesn't change when you do right moves. So those, uh, <coughs> uh, those crossings uh, all have this parity property, either even or odd. So you can um, assign, uh, and you, you know, you can assign uh, one tri-bracket to the even crossings and another to the odd crossings, 
And then to make it interesting, you need to do this with virtual crossings because for classical knots, they're just always uh, even. Um, so then uh, another idea was to look at link tri-brackets. So this is where you have um, different tri-bracket operations at single component crossings versus multi-component crossings. Um, we're used to distinguishing single, single component from multi-component crossings for computing, for example, the um, linking number of a, of a link. And so are these uh, link tri-brackets as well. Okay, so moving in a slightly different direction, um, let me tell you briefly about tri-bracket brackets. So this is joint work with uh, Lyra Agarwal and Patricia Rivera, who um, were both um, students of mine at uh, uh, Claremont McKenna. So um, <clears throat> one of the other threads of my current research program involves uh, what I call biquandal brackets. Um, and it's just a coincidence that the word bracket there, it's not the same bracket from tri-bracket, but tri-bracket bracket. Um, so um, the bracket in biquandal bracket comes from a Kaufman bracket. So these are skein invariants of biquandal colored knots. Um, and the first biquandal bracket paper, um, I um, co-wrote that with Veronica Rivera, who is um, Patricia's older sister. So um, when Patricia and I started to think about doing our second paper, we thought it would be nice to apply the biquandal bracket idea, but to try brackets. So um, the basic idea is to um, do skein theory for uh, try bracket colored uh, diagrams. All right, so we have um, skein relation with skein coefficients that are functions of the tri-bracket colors at the crossing. All right, so here's the setup. If you have a positive crossing with tri-bracket colors A, B, C, then we'll have for the vertical smoothing um, a coefficient of A sub A, B, C. And for the horizontal smoothing, we'll have a coefficient of B, A, B, C. And at um, a uh, negative crossing, then we have their inverses. And uh, the value of a circle will be delta, and um, the value of a positive uh, twist will be w, and the value of a negative twist will be w inverse. And so if you read um, that paper, which is also published, um, uh, although in that case, um, the published version has uh, some typos that got introduced in the uh, publication process. So I would recommend just reading the version that's on archive. But in any case, um, the, uh, um, the uh, um, tri-bracket colored Reinemeister moves give us the conditions needed for uh, the uh, invariance of uh, these um, uh, tri-bracket brackets. And uh, just as in the case with biquandal brackets, you can obtain the classical skein invariants like the Alexander Conway polynomial, Jones polynomial, the Kaufman two variable polynomial, the Homfly polynomial. Those can all be considered as special cases of uh, tri-bracket bracket invariants. But there's additional invariants that um, at least um, aren't obviously the same as these other ones. Okay, so moving on again. Um, uh, another project I did recently on uh, tri-brackets uh, was with uh, my collaborators uh, Kanako Oshiro from uh, Sofia University and Natsumi Oyamaguchi from uh, Shuna University. Um, so uh, for this project, we wanted to consider what's the relationship between biquandals and tri-brackets. So um, I know I haven't talked about biquandals in this talk, uh, but a biquandal is like a quandal except that instead of just uh, colors changing when you go under, uh, they also change when you go over. And so there are colorings of the edges in the four valent graph you get by flattening the, uh, the knot diagram to get a, uh, a, a graph. Um, so um, Kanako's idea was to say, okay, suppose we start with a tri-bracket coloring, then um, <clears throat> that this, the fact that we have A and B on the left and right of the semi-arc suggests that we should label the semi-arc with a pair, A comma B. And similarly here, we'll label this one with A comma C. Um, and this one we'll label over here with B comma tri-bracket ABC. And this one we'll label with C comma tri-bracket ABC. Uh, and so then um, we can sort of forget about the regions and uh, just think about these uh, semi-arc colors. And so the algebraic structure that we get from this, uh, we called a uh, local uh, biquandal. So it's only a partially defined operation on the Cartesian product of uh, tri-bracket colors. And the reason for that is 
that in order to, um, to stick these two together uh, with uh, over, over star or under star, uh, with the a comma b and the a comma c, their first element has to be the same, right? Their first component has to be the same. So this gives us a sort of partially defined operation on the Cartesian product. Um, but on that subset where it's defined, the biquandal axioms are satisfied. So we call this a local biquandal. Um, so one of our motivations for looking at this was that Nebjadovsky had introduced uh, a homology theory for tri-brackets with uh, these, uh, for using uh, three co-cycles uh, uh, for these uh, tri-brackets to uh, enhance the counting invariant. But um, even just writing down um, the, um, even just writing down um, the uh, um, the boundary map in the in the um, three co cycle case itself was extremely difficult to do, um, and so um, as I say, my co-authors Kanako Shiro and Matsumi Oyamaguchi uh, proved that Nebjadovsky's tri bracket homology is actually isomorphic to the biquandal homology of the corresponding local biquandal. So. Um, and uh, in current work, uh, Kanako and I are investigating the relationships between local biquandals, shadow biquandals, and tri brackets. Um, so I have an example of a local biquandal that can be completed to a regular biquandal in a couple of different ways. Um, okay, for my final example coming from a paper, um, I want to tell you about uh, this project I did with Jian Kim and Suyan Zhang from Busan National University in South Korea. So uh, the idea here was to study pseudo knots, singular knots, and links uh, using uh, region coloring to develop a region coloring structure uh, for those uh, objects. So um, uh, first, what is a pseudo knot and what's a singular knot? So a singular knot is a four valent spatial graph uh, that is a uh, graph with uh, vertices of degree four that's been knotted in space with the restriction that um, at each vertex, the cyclic ordering of the edges going around the vertex has to stay fixed. So you're not allowed to kind of swivel the, uh, the, of the edges at a, uh, at a singular uh, crossing. So I like to think of those as like uh, knots where the uh, strands have become stuck together and kind of fused in a particular, uh, a particular ordering. Um, pseudo knots, on the other hand, are um, ordinary classical knots, but about which we only have partial information. Right, so the origin of this comes from biology, where biologists are looking at these um, uh, like knotted DNA strands or knotted proteins. And so these are really, really tiny strings. And so it can be really hard to tell in the picture which strand is on top. So you have some crossings where you can tell and some where you don't know which one is on top and which one is, is on the bottom. And so um, those ones where we can't tell, we call those uh, pre-crossings, or at least in the mathematical version, we have like classical crossings and then pre-crossings. And you can think of pre-crossings as a kind of like probability. Uh, so, a, so a pseudonaut becomes a kind of probability distribution uh, where you have um, the pre-crossings are somehow 50% one, one type of crossing and 50% the other. Um, so, uh, and so it's an interesting question is what kind of knot theory can you do with uh, this only limited information, right? So a few years ago, I was doing two projects, one on singular knot theory and the other on pseudo knot theory. And I had just finished drawing the singular knot Rademeister moves and started drawing the pseudo knot Rademeister moves and went, wait a minute, uh, these are basically the same moves. So um, if you replace a singular crossing with a pre-crossing, uh, as we call the, the crossings where we don't know which one is on top, um, then you get the same set of moves with the exception that there's an extra move for pseudo knots, which is a, like a pseudo Rademeister one move. So, but um, for the region coloring um, uh, uh, structure in particular, um, they are um, the, uh, um, the um, uh, set of um, uh, algebraic axioms that you get for both types are identical, right? And so we call the structure a psi bracket, right? So a psi bracket is a multi-tri bracket uh, where you have a classical crossing uh, tri bracket operation, and then you have a pseudo or singular crossing tri bracket operation. So for this paper, we decided to go with the vertical notation. So here are the classical tri bracket operations, and this is the um, pseudo tri bracket operation. And so as in the other multi-tri bracket cases, we have axioms 
uh, relating these um, algebraic structures that come from the uh, Rademeister moves that uh, relate the, uh, the combinatorial crossing types. So here's an example um, of a psi bracket. So th this uh, three tensor over here is the classical uh, crossing operation. And then this three tensor over here gives us the um, pseudo uh, three, uh, sorry, the pseudo slash singular uh, tri bracket um, operation. So um, just with this one like small three element uh, example, uh, we're able to <coughs> sort the list of all um, pseudo knots with up to 10 crossings into uh, these five bins uh, based on how many colorings they have. And so, yeah, this one is not a complete invariant, but this is just one, you know, um, very small finite example. There's infinitely many different psi brackets um, with uh, infinitely many different uh, sizes. All right, so for the final application, I wanted to tell you a little bit about what I've been up to regarding um, uh, music. So um, since my grad school days, I've been a Gotham Industrial Dance Club DJ, uh, in addition to being a topologist. Um, so you may have heard uh, there are theorems in my dissertation whose original proofs were written on bar napkins and eyeliner. And recently I started composing music using elements of knot theory um, in um, an, an experimental knot music project that I call modulo torsion. So um, how this relates to um, uh, tri brackets is that so my Python code for computing tri bracket colorings uh, represents a tri bracket coloring of a knot as a pair of ordered lists of colors on the left and the right for each semi arc as we go around the knot. So um, if you assign the elements, the notes in a musical scale, so in, in the example I'll show you here in a minute, we'll use C natural minor music, uh, musical scale. Um, we assign those notes to the tri bracket colors, then um, uh, that will convert those sequences into melodies, right? So the way to think about it is that we have a starting point on the knot diagram and we have our tri bracket coloring. And as we go around the knot diagram, we're going to see some notes, some colors, which we'll interpret as notes on our left and some on our right. And as we go around, we get the sequence of those uh, notes. So then what I'll do is pan the left side colors to the left and the right side colors to the right. Um, and that's going to give us an interesting stereo field effect, uh, which I find works really well with uh, bass lines. So um, to complete the rest of the track, um, I, I um, add, <coughs> excuse me, I add uh, melodic lines sequenced from, in this case, the, the tri brackets operation three tensor. Um, there's two of those, and then there's another one um, that uh, comes from uh, one line in the three tensor that's being arpeggiated with um, another with a, another section of that uh, three tensor. Um, and then there's also um, to complete the track, you need not just melodies, but I added also uh, some drums and uh, a, a drone track as well as some samples to, to uh, make it interesting. Um, so. Um, Let's listen to just the beginning of the track here, maybe about the first two minutes or so of the track. I highly recommend that you use headphones for this. Um, so let me just briefly mention, um, this is the 6-2 knot uh, that I used uh, to make this track. I call this track Tensor Noise. It was just released a couple of days ago. Um, and uh, over here on the left, this is a depiction of the Operation 3 tensor. It was a seven element uh, three tensor. Um, to go with the uh, seven notes of the uh, C minor natural scale. Um, and so, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and uh, listen to about the first two minutes or so of this uh, track.
the rest of that track along with uh, um, many other uh, tracks at uh, modulotorsion.bandcamp.com. Um, I have uh, free unlimited streaming there, so you can feel free to listen as much as you like. Um, let me mention also that for those who are more into classical music, I have a classical knot music composition project called Zero Genus because, you know, classical knots are virtual knots with zero virtual genus, um, which you can find at musescore.com slash zero genus. Uh, so far there, I have only one uh, uh, song posted, which is a, uh, um, which is a, a string quartet uh, composed from by Quandle Colorings of the virtual knot 4.69. So um, with that, uh, let me say thanks for listening and um, take care everyone. <laughs>